Okay, so before we get started, <laughs> I'll just put a picture of it here. Um, new skirt though. Anyway, so today I'm going to talk about some elements from historical fashion that I have noticed Lolita fashion tends to borrow from. If you're wondering why I'm so off to the side, it's because I'm going to be showing a lot of pictures and I decided it'll be easier for me to just, when I'm editing, go loop. So there we go. It's said over and over again that the silhouette of Lolita fashion is inspired by Victorian and Rococo fashion, but that's pretty vague, so I did a little digging. In the first place, Victorian fashion is not a monolith. So when you say Victorian fashion, you could be referring to any variety of looks, um, because it did more or less change every decade between 1837 and Queen Victoria's death in 1901, and then that was followed by the Edwardian era. In this 1841 painting, you can clearly see the bell-shaped skirt. And the 1840s is also when we start to see reasonable bonnets. And I say reasonable because the bonnets of the 1830s, much like everything else, about 1830s fashion, were awful. <laughs> in the 1850s, the skirts actually grew bigger, and this shape was achieved by wearing the crinoline underneath the petticoats, underneath the skirts. And this decade is also when tiered skirts were in fashion, and you can see that look in some Lolita pieces today. Then we reached the 1860s, where skirts were at their widest width, and this is the decade also where we see lace making a comeback in terms of popularity. So in the 1860s, women wore pagoda sleeves during the day, and then in the evening they wore much lower necklines. So even though we don't see those lower necklines in Lolita, at least not commonly, um, we do sometimes see the pagoda sleeve pop up, which is pretty interesting, um, aesthetically. Approaching the end of the decade is where we stop seeing similarities in terms of skirt shape we instead see the advent of the bustle and skirt width narrows considerably throughout the 1870s. Now we're journeying further back in time, actually a hundred years further back in time, to the Rococo era, which lasted roughly from the 1730s to the 1760s. So as far as Rococo fashion, I do see similarities from elements such as um, the ruffles and the princess sleeves, but that's mostly it. Um, cat, cat, what are you doing? Stop. But skirt shape, not so much. Maybe at the beginning of the era in the 1730s, but beyond that, it gets a little weird. <laughs> All right, so from there, let's jump ahead about 200 years. Skirt-wise, Lolita's current silhouette also puts me in mind of Christian Dior's new look. It's the quintessential full A-line skirt. It's what we think of when we think of fashion in the 50s. Dior created that. In fact, he created it in 1947. And, you know, this was post-World post -World War II, and women wanted to feel feminine again. They had to adopt such masculine roles while the men were all out at war, and Dior tapped into that. 
And I think it sort of makes sense that it becomes clear that maybe Dior was thinking of fashion from the 1840s, 50s, and 60s because those times are seen as distinctly feminine. So it makes sense to me that Lolita fashion sort of resembles the new look. But the skirt is much shorter, the chest is much flatter, as opposed to the big boob obsession of the, of the 1950s. And from there, you add in elements from Victorian and Rococo fashions. I want to return to the topic of skirt width and flatter or bigger chests. Um, so when the Victorian skirt started to billow up, uh, whether or not the women or whether or not all of the women were aware of it, some satirical cartoonists were definitely aware of it. The skirt was so big to keep men <laughs> more or less at arm's length, which is more in tow with what Lolita is supposed to be. <laughs> but this is flipped totally on its head when we talk about the 1950s. So the body ideal of the 1950s was the voluptuous shape, the cinched waist and the big hips and the big pointy breasts. The full skirt wasn't about keeping men away. It was about, like I said, a return to femininity, a return to propriety, a return to traditional family values. So. Not only were the big breasts seen as like sexy, but they were also seen as like a return to motherhood. The men were back, the family was whole again. So yes, traditional family values with a sexy hourglass shape. Lolita fashion differs in that it's not trying to be sexy at all. In fact, it's trying to be the opposite of sexy. Well, except for Aero Lolita, which very few Lolitas do, and since it's extremely hard to pull off, even fewer Lolitas do it well. I'm sorry if you can hear that. The cats just have a thing against me today. The cats just have a thing against me filming today. But also, Lolita fashion differs from all of those historical silhouettes in that the norm no longer requires us to wear girdles, stays, corsets, stomachers in order to mold our bodies to fit the dress. We no longer are forced to try to fit this cookie cutter ideal. Don't get me wrong, um, plus size Lolitas and bigger chested Lolitas still do have a harder time finding pieces that fit. But more and more often we are finding designers who include dresses with elements like back shearing or bigger sizes to help accommodate different body types. In other words, there's more room for body diversity and we keep progressing. In short, Lolita fashion is unique and beautiful and it draws not only from some of the most luxuriously feminine decades in fashion history, but it also... It also draws from some of my favorite <laughs> decades in fashion history. This is the one. This is the one that's been making all the noise. Look at this. This face of shame. Were you ashamed? We should be. This one's just been sleeping the whole time. Look at him. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me for another video. Shout out to... Shout out to LCT Comics and Cassie and Holly. Likes and subscribes help me out quite a lot, and I'll see you next time. Bye!